Negotiations come to fruition and create the Treaty of Paris of 1783. This is the treaty that ends the Revolutionary War, not to be confused with the Treaty of Paris of 1763, which ended the French and Indian War. We talked about that last week. One digit of difference between the two treaties. Anyway, the Treaty of Paris does about what you'd expect. Uh, it ends the war. The British recognize U.S. independence, but there is a surprise. Surprise on the next slide. First, let's talk about this. This is the U.S. treaty delegation. You've got Ben Franklin, who was already in Paris, joined now by John Adams and John Jay and a couple other guys. And the British negotiators were supposed to be here, but they were so embarrassed, so ashamed uh, about British defeat, they refused to sit for the painting, so the painter just abandoned the whole project. Never even finished John Adams's uh, pants. So here's the surprise. In the Treaty of Paris, the British give the United States the Ohio country. That's the territory between the Appalachian Mountains and the Mississippi River, the Ohio River Valley. Now, the British didn't have to do that. The Americans had locked up control of the 13 states, but they did not have control of most of the Ohio River Valley. The Indians, supported by British troops, were um, standing firm there. The Quebecois fur trade continuing to thrive. So it was a real surprise when the British hand the Ohio country to the Americans. What's going on there? Well, for one, they probably knew that the Americans would uh, try to get it sooner or later, and this seemed um, an easier way to do it. Um, but there's even more going on than that. The British know that their rivalry with France is going to go on. They're going to be tangling with France sooner or later, and they'd really like Americans to stay out of it next time. And th the British are hoping, therefore, that if they give the United States this nice gift that maybe it will help detach the United States from France and the U.S. will be on the sidelines next time France and Britain throw down. All right, let's hand out some trophies. Who are the winners of the American Revolution? Well, obviously the Patriots um, are, are winners because the Patriot side won, the United States is a thing. There are some surprising winners, however like blacks in the north. Now, there weren't that many blacks in the north, right? 90% of um, black folks in the United States at the time lived in the south. It was the south that had economies predicated on slave labor. The north, not so much. Many blacks in the north earn their freedom during the war by, uh, by serving in the armed forces, like this gentleman. He is this guy right here, is serving in the Rhode Island militia and thereby earning his freedom. So good for him, right? This is, um, you know, this is similar to what the British are doing in the South. In the South, the British are offering freedom uh, during the war. They were offering freedom to any slaves who ran away and joined the British side. In the North, the Northern states are basically matching that offer, right? Join the state militia and um, we will reward you with your freedom. But then, later in the war, and shortly after the war, every northern state abolishes slavery. Now, why does the North do this? Answer, they believe in the ideas of the revolution. They read the Declaration where Jefferson writes, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. Northerners read that and they take it literally. They're like, we can't in good conscience continue to hold human beings in slavery if we believe all these things. Now, it's easy for the North to follow through on their beliefs because, well, there's not that many slaves in the North, so it's not really disrupting their economy to end slavery. So they go ahead and do it. Another winner, democracy, right? The Americans are fighting this war for um, to protect government by the people, 
and after the war we're going to see democracy continue to expand, more and more people getting involved in voting and politics. Religious freedom is a big winner in the revolution. The, you know, before the revolution, Catholics weren't allowed to vote, Catholics weren't allowed to hold office in many colonies. Now those restrictions are gone. The uh, patriots don't believe in religious tests um, for voting or for holding office, so those go away. Colonists, also, the Americans also don't believe in established churches anymore. So most states start disestablishing their churches. Ta there's no longer going to be an official church supported by tax dollars. Officers in the Continental Army are winners in this war. Winners because Congress wants to make sure they don't plot another conspiracy. So they find a way to keep the officers happy using the land uh, in the Ohio country that they got in the treaty negotiations. They're going to give leading officers in the Continental Army gifts of land out west. Right? They, um, you know, they're still going to pay off those bonds um, later on. You know, they still they still owe the officers money, but they figure if they give them uh, vast tracts of land out west that they can either go live on or hang on to and later sell, that this is a good way to um, to keep them loyal. Let's shift to losers. Well, the while. Continental Army officers were winners with those big land grants. Regular soldiers in the Continental Army are losers because they don't get any gifts of land out west. They're still holding on to the bonds uh, that have been issued to them to pay for their um, service in the revolution, and they're not getting paid yet, so they're pretty unhappy about that. You know who else is holding bonds and pretty unhappy about it? Uh, all those farmers whose harvests got uh, confiscated by the Continental Army or colonial militias, all the merchants whose inventories got jacked by um, the Continental Army and colonial militias um, and state militias, you know, they're also holding on to bonds, also not getting paid yet, eager for the government to solve its cash flow problem so they can get paid for the sacrifices they made during the revolution. Loyalists are uh, clear losers, right? They're, their side lost, and a lot of loyalists lose their property. Um, state governments will often confiscate loyalist property, um, you know, take their land, auction it off, auction off their possessions. Uh, they see this as punishment for loyalists fighting on the wrong side in the war. A lot of loyalists um, leave. They, um, you know, they feel threatened. In some cases, they are literally threatened. Um, you know, you will die if you try to stay. So they, um, so they bail. There are loyalist refugees who migrate to Canada, to um, the British Caribbean. Some go back to Britain. You know, some loyalists stick around, and it's okay. But uh, most loyalists um, are forced out, or, uh, or I should say, many loyalists are forced out, um, or feel they have to leave. Or you know are just angry because their um, you know all their their land got confiscated. Blacks in the South, which is again 90% of the um, of the black population in the U.S., um, they're losers. Um, losers because slavery continues unabated in the South. Right? Southerners read the same words in the Declaration of Independence: "All men are created equal, right to life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, whatever." They figure. Jefferson must have only meant white men. Why do they think this? Well, Jefferson owns a couple hundred slaves, and he didn't free them. So they figure, why should we? And indeed, uh, southern slaveholders um, are still... Indians are big losers as well. The... You know, they, of course, sided with the British because the British uh, were 
going to let them keep their land and continue trading fur with the Quebecois. But now the British have uh, awarded the Ohio country to um, the United States, and the Indians know their days are numbered. They know that the Americans are going to, you know, show up eventually and do what they do, invade, push the Indians aside, kill them, take their land, convert it to farmland. Um, gentleman in the photo is Joseph Brandt, a loyalist uh, Mohawk who fought on the British side in the war. He, he does survive the war, but um, it's not going to be good for uh, his people. And lastly, it's not going to be good for established churches. We saw on the previous slide that um, this is a victory for religious freedom. Established churches are disestablished now. Um, so established churches, of course, the Anglican Church in most colonies, the Church of England, Puritan Church up in New England. But uh, you know, both of them are now you know, uh, in most states um, they lose tax-supported status, they lose their official designation, they now need to compete for worshippers with all the other churches. The Anglicans can't even call themselves Anglicans anymore because Anglican means English, uh, can't really call it the Church of England now that the United States is independent, and so Anglicans in the United States start calling themselves Episcopalians. There's, there's a lot of them, like George Washington was an, Episc uh, was an Anglican, now is an Episcopalian, because um, that's the American name for the church. So yeah, that's it. Winners and losers of the American Revolution.